some new approaches that I feel are worth covering. Marxism. Now, 20 years ago, we would have included Marxism as a major point of study. Marxism has, in IR theory, kind of fallen off the popular wagon here for obvious reasons. But Marxism still has some valid points to make. Okay? Chief of which is that Marxism in IR theory functions somewhat similar to realist ways of thinking, but they're not happy about it. Marxism argues that states are exploited by more powerful states, right? In the same way that Marx looks at the economic dichotomy between workers and manufacturing and management, right? The haves and the have-nots. Marxism, like realism, agrees that there are some states in the world that are just simply more powerful than others. Realism looks at this and says, that's just the way that things have always been. Marxism looks at that and says, that's because of colonialism. That's because of economic advantage. That's also because the smaller countries have been perpetually exploited by more powerful countries because of the latter's desire for resources, manpower, and other material goods that perpetuate that hegemonic domination. So a realist would look at this and say, it's just my turn to be powerful, your turn to be weak. Marxism says the powerful states go through certain measures to perpetuate their power to maintain their hegemony in the world by keeping the weaker countries perpetually weak and perpetually dependent upon them. Quite possibly the best example is through the use of capitalism, <coughs> right? capitalism in particular. Whether it's the earlier form of capitalism, like imperialism or colonialism, or the more recent forms of capitalism, modern day corporations used through globalization. Whatever it happens to be, think of it like this. Around the 1990s, around 1995, 1996, whatever, the internet became a thing. As soon as the internet becomes a thing, major companies start exploit, you know, start using, start using the internet, start using global communication to expand transnational global capital. It is, I would think at this point, fairly obvious that there are certain companies and corporations in the world today that have a major global advantage, not only in name recognition, but also in profits. Microsoft, Coca-Cola, Nike, McDonald's, these are companies global companies that have larger profit revenues per year than most third world countries. Just think about that. McDonald's makes more money than certain countries do. Microsoft makes more money. Walmart, for God's sake, Walmart makes more money, profits more money than some developing countries. It stands to reason that with that economic leverage, these companies through national protections, can use that leverage to buy up more competition, expand their markets into other areas, and keep developing countries in the developing sector. So it's very similar to realism's recognition of hierarchy in the world. There's a major difference. The Marxists are really pissed off about it. Okay? In a few weeks, Wait until you read E.H. Carr's The 20 Years Crisis. Wait until you read Carr. You can almost feel the seethingness from the text. Marxism and, uh, Marxism and realism, not that different. Except the fact that you can say that Marxists are kind of like really, they're like realists who hate to admit that they're realists. And probably a better way of understanding Marxism in this case is through a subunit coined by Emmanuel Wallerstein, what we know as world systems theory. Okay? World systems theory. It's probably one of the best ways of understanding how the world is socially and most importantly economically dichotomized. According to Wallerstein, the world is roughly divided into three spheres of influence. What he refers to as core countries, peripheral countries, 
and somewhere in the middle, semi-core, semi-periphery. But the most important are core and periphery. The core countries, those are your modern industrialized states. What a Marxist would call the equivalent of the bourgeois. Your Great Britons, United States, France, Germany, Belgium, Luxembourg, Netherlands. Okay? The countries that kind of corner the market on transnational capitalism in the 19th century and have never lost a day's pay since. These are the countries which have not only the economic leverage, but this leverage is transformed into political leverage. The amount of money that one carries, that's going to easily be seen in diplomacy. It's not a surprise that there are certain countries in the world that have an exact one-to-one -one ratio, global voice, economic power. At the opposite end of the spectrum are the proletariats, the periphery. Back in early Marxist theory days, the periphery were the colonies. India, Pakistan, Latin America, pretty much most of Africa for that matter, Southeast Asia. The peripheral countries is where the core countries draw all their resources from. The core countries take the natural resources from the periphery, refine them into finished products, and then sell them back to the periphery. Okay? So the peripheral country, the paradox, the peripheral countries are rich in resources. They're rich in material wealth. But they are handicapped. They are institutionally, structurally, and politically handicapped by economic and industrial competitiveness. So going back to that example of the 1990s, when the world suddenly globalizes, <coughs> under previous forms of protectionism, or just simply rudimentary communication, smaller firms, smaller enterprises, what we'll call a mom and pop shop enterprises, of smaller peripheral countries, may have been able to survive because their customer base was largely located within the region. The products that they made may not have necessarily been the best products, but they did the job. When global capitalism becomes the next best thing after the collapse of the Cold War system, almost every single core industry, whether it's automotive, computers, tech, what have you, ends up buying out, destroying any competition from these peripheral countries simply because of economic advantage. One very good example of this. During the Cold War, Soviet satellite states all had their own car companies. Does anybody happen to know what some, com you know, what some car names from communist countries uh, may have been? Yeah, the, the most famous one was the Yugo from Yugoslavia. All right, if everyone knows this one, they probably know about the Yugo. Okay, not exactly the best car in the world. Yugo comes from Yugoslavia. Okay, any other cars that you might know? Trabant. Trabant comes from what country? Czechoslovakia. Close. North. Uh, East Germany. East Germany. Czechoslovakia gives us Škodas. Romania gives us Dacias, so on and so forth. We're not exactly talking about the nicest looking cars in the world. Some of them were downright but ugly. But from communist point of view, hey, what do you want? I go from point A to point B. What do you want? Skoda is same as Mercedes, except cheap. Right? Okay. Here's the thing. In a global market, if you have the opportunity, you can buy, and you have, you have the money, money's not an issue, you can buy a brand new Mercedes, or you can buy, or you can buy a Trabi. Which one are you going to buy? You can buy a Mercedes. Trust me. Google image Trabis. Okay? Not exactly the nicest cars in the world. As a matter of fact, as soon as communist countries collapse, these factories are almost automatically shut down. Okay? Today, Mercedes, Volkswagen, Audi, and BMW still in business. Hugo shut down its car factories, I think, for the last time in 2006. Surprisingly, they had a rather resilient run. Okay? 
None of them are. None of them work today. Why? Because nobody wants to buy them. That doesn't mean. Look, you could just simply say, look, competitiveness makes better products work. I'm totally okay with that. The only trouble is, is that there was never an opportunity for these car companies to improve. It's never an opportunity for them to survive. Okay? And why? Because the core countries effectively bought out any competition from the periphery. Okay? So world systems theory is somewhat of an offshoot of Marxism, but it does play rather nicely when we are discussing globalization today. Right? This is probably the best way of looking at it. Okay, we've talked about core, we've talked about periphery. The core countries, again, your modern industrialized Western states that have effectively run the show since day one because they're the ones that coined the idea. The peripheral countries are what we would call your third world countries. What about the semi-core? The semi-core is a weird, rather flexible period here. Semi-core countries are either countries that previously had the economic wherewithal, but have somehow lost their way along the past few decades, but still enough to be considered to be novelty items. Or, more likely, doesn't happen all that often, but it does, certain peripheral countries that just work and work and get lucky and download cheap mods and do whatever it's possible to eventually move into the semi-core. Which countries do you think today comprise semi-core, semi-peripheral countries? Which countries do you think fit into that yellow ring today? <coughs> Some examples here, Adam. India. India, it's a good example. India was, for the longest time, a peripheral country. It formed what was necessary for the British Empire's work. Although in the past 15 to 20 years, India has certainly benefited from a number of global advantages, chief of which is every time you have a problem with your computer, you call up a call center and you're pretty much talking to Bombay. Okay. What other countries do you think? India is one good one. Brazil. Brazil is also one that was a peripheral country, is now one of the fastest growing economies in Latin America. Okay? That's a good one too. We might even be able to detect, detect a pattern here. If we have India and we have Brazil, Argentina. Argentina, yes. Argentina is a new one as well. Not bad. Israel? Israel, I would almost put as a poor country. I would almost put Israel as a... Israel is kind of a weird case. Because Israel really is a chunk of Europe that survives the war and takes their economic and political wherewithal down here and kind of picks up where the 1930s left off. Um, but Israel is certainly, certainly a major, major economy in the Middle East. But I would actually put them in, in a core country. South Korea? South Korea is, at this stage of the game, almost moving into a core country. South Korea went from, it's hard to imagine, ladies and gentlemen, in the 50s and 60s, which Korea was the better Korea? North Korea actually was best Korea in the 1960s and 70s. South Korea was basket case Korea until the 1980s come around. And you may have heard of this little company, little startup, Kickstarter thing called, oh, I don't know, Samsung. Yeah, they're actually putting most of the Japanese firms to shame. South Korea, on a bad day, semi core. I would almost put them in a core country today. Luxembourg? Luxembourg has always been a core country. Okay, Luxembourg is just one big ginormous tax haven for the fabulously wealthy. Okay. Taiwan. Taiwan could very well be a semi-core, even though Taiwan's not a country, but I'll throw it in there, sure. Mexico? Mexico, on a good day, yeah, I can see semi-core. But it is kind of funny. It is almost sort of funny. We've mentioned Taiwan, we've mentioned all these other things. There's one other country. Where's the 800-pound the gorilla in the room? That's the 900 pound gorilla in the room. That's the 800 pound bear in the room. Um, yes, Russia has, I think, almost always been stuck here in the semi core. Uh, there are parts of Russia that are well out of your price range to live in, and there's other parts of Russia that I don't even think have been mapped by Google yet. Um, so I think I'll put Russia there, sure. Um, China? China, of course. China, surprisingly enough, is not a poor country just yet. China is still a major manufacturing center. Wait another 20 to 25 years, 
and we'll see what happens when a consumer class finally arises. Okay? Any other countries that we might want to throw in? There? I have a question. Yes, go ahead. Is this based solely off economic power, or is it like other factors involved? It starts from economic power. It starts from economic power, but then it is translated into political power. Okay. So world systems theory under Wallerstein makes the argument that economic capabilities are in fact transformed into political advantages or disadvantages. Right. So when we talk about the more periphery, we're talking here about these are countries that not only have strong economies, but are decision makers. These are the ones that set policy. These down here may have all the resources, but they have no independent economic planning and little economic decision making. Over here, I would also throw in Spain, Portugal as well. I would throw in Southern Europe. But these are places that either fall into one of two categories. One, they do benefit from the decisions of the core. Or two, they're able to have sort of their own autonomous decision making, nobody really pays attention to them. Right. Okay, Adam. Is it Iran semi-core country? Iran right now is clearly, definitely semi-core. In fact, Iran may have been periphery before 2003. Now, Iran is definitely, definitely a major, major country. Okay? All right.